Uh, thank you. Um, I can go ahead and start. Um, so, so in this talk, um, we are going to uh, uh, discuss some of the projects that we have uh, been doing at uh, Google uh, Brains Machine Learning for Systems and Chip Design team. Um, so our motivation for founding uh, this team um, three years ago, three and a half years ago, was the following, uh, that uh, in the past decade, systems and hardware have really transformed machine learning. Um, and uh, we uh, want to use machine learning now to basically uh, return the favor and transform the way systems and hardware uh, are designed. Um, um, it's uh, pr uh, perhaps very uh, obvious for a lot of our audience here is uh, that um, the computational demand of AI algorithms uh, are increasing at an exponential rate, uh, rate. For example, this um, table here, what it's predicting is in order to achieve 1% um, uh, error rate on ImageNet, we need another 10 to the power 14 gigaflops. If we just like follow the uh, the trend that uh, it has been going so far, um, and this other chart that pre that uh, kind of uh, says that the amount of computational power in AI runs is doubling um, every few months, and this uh, trend uh, really tells us that we need significantly better systems and chips in order to be able to uh, keep up and serve um, future AI models. Now, uh, it turns out that the complexity of uh, chip place, uh, like uh, chip optimization, uh, like is way higher than that uh, those of uh, previous games uh, that are solved by uh, AI, like chess and Go. Here we are showing the uh, state space for each of these games. And as you can see, these uh, the number of different ways that you can like play these games is significantly like orders of magnitude lower than the number of different ways you can play the game of chip placement. And chip placement is only one problem in the process of chip design. So we are dealing with a really uh, com complex problem. Uh, now, many problems uh, in systems and chips have this a uh, combinatorial uh, optimization kind of format on graph structure data. Um, if you think about it, compiler optimization, chip placement, data center resource allocation, all of them, they have some input in the form of a graph, such as an, uh, in the compiler case, uh, could be like an <clears throat> XLA, HLO graph. The, the optimization objective is um, some sort of a decision making on the ops of this graph. For example, it could be the schedule the scheduling of the ops. If the input graph is a chip, it could be the placement and such. So, uh, so with that, uh, what we are interested in uh, in the type of projects we do is to take a learning based approach to optimizations to this problem. Um, uh, to some of the some of them I mentioned in the previous slide. And the reason we are interested about ML is that unlike traditional approaches, such as uh, branch unbound, hill climbing, or, or um, ILP solvers, uh, a learning-based approach can um, understand the relationship between our target optimization metric and, uh, and the context of the problem. Uh, it can basically learn that, right? Uh, that comes from the name and use this uh, relationship to uh, explore different optimization trade-offs. Uh, it can also gain experience as uh, we solve more instances of the problem. Um, and this is unlike any of the existing approaches to these kind of decision-making optimization tasks because we, we believe that if an algorithm becomes better as we train it with more data, as it solves more problems, um, that's the only way to to really like become an expert and become, be able to generalize to new unseen problems. Um, and also we know, we know, given the advances in machine learning and deep learning, we know how to um, 
scale them onto distributed platforms uh, and train really you know, large model can models that can under uh, that can learn from these uh, complex problems uh, that we are targeting. So these are our, really our motivations for why we are taking learning based approaches to these problems. Now the outline of this talk is as follows: In the first part, um, uh, we uh, uh, explain our work on chip placement optimization, uh, in which we used a, a deep RL approach to to solve uh, the problem of chip placement and advanced technology node sizes. And the other uh, uh, portion of the talk uh, focuses on um, hardware software co-design approaches for um, um creating customized accelerators so basically we're focusing on two different uh, parts of chip design stack the high level like hardware software co-design all the way to the back end uh, placement um, uh, stage of the chip design so um uh, before i dive into the problems uh here are our goals for our uh, ml for chip design uh kind of projects. Uh, so our vision is that we want to reduce the design cycle from the current uh, one and a half to two years process uh, of designing chips to uh, only a few weeks. Um, and uh, we like that because we think uh, the way chips are designed right now, uh, they're really ser designed to serve our neural net architectures that come out two to five years from now. And given that the process of uh, innovation in deep learning uh, is much faster. Uh, shortening this uh, design uh, cycle can really help us to be far more adaptive to the changes in, in AI and machine learning uh, models. Um, and also we think that new possibilities will emerge uh, if, we, uh, we, if we are able to evolve neural net architectures and chips together, because maybe we can think up new new types of uh, neural networks that currently we don't even try because um, they do not do well on the existing hardware. Um, and also, um, we are interested in designing chips that are faster, that are cheaper, and more environmentally friendly. So these are our goals. Uh, now, back to the chip placement problem. Um, here is how we define or formulated the problem. So we have a, um, a graph that describes the chip, and this graph has several nodes, uh, in fact, uh, millions of nodes. Um, the, the nodes are either macros or memory modules or um, standard cells, uh, which in this case, uh, you can think of it as a cluster of um, um, gates and logic. Um, and the goal is to place the components of this large graph um, onto a um, chip ca uh, canvas such that certain properties are um, optimized. And also we have to kind of follow certain constraints. For example, after we place these nodes, we want um, the violent uh, of these nodes to be minimized or we, want, uh, we cannot allow certain nodes to overlap with each other. Again, going back, um, this was the problem that uh, had a much, much larger uh, search space uh, than, than the, these previous ga games uh, solved by AI. So, um, and prior approaches to placement, uh, there are three categories of the, them that we are showing here. Uh, the methods based on uh, partitioning uh, ma based methods such as MinCAD, um, uh, hill climbing methods such as simulated annealing, uh, analytical solvers such as replace uh, or dream place. And um, uh, what we proposed was a learning based method. Uh, so let's dive into how, uh, how our method works. Uh, so we basically took a, a deep uh, reinforcement learning approach to this problem um, in which we train a policy that starts from an empty canvas and places the, the policy, starts placing the nodes of the chip one at a time. And then once everything is placed, um, we can calculate a reward function. The reward function could be a weighted average of um, metrics such as wireland that correlates with uh, timing and power uh, density um, and also congestion that, uh, that 
uh, ensures that the 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 placement is actually um, valid and it's uh, manufacturable. Uh, and the actions, as you can see, are placing the the nodes one at a time onto the grid uh, cells that we have already uh, uh, placed onto this canvas. So uh, the canvas, you can think of it as a grid uh, in which um, uh, our actions are on which cell of this grid we place the next node. Now, um, in each iteration of the policy training, this process is done. Uh, the reward function calculated, and then we can use the re reward function uh, in this case, um, to optimize the parameters of the policy. In this case, we use uh, PPO, like proximal policy optimization, for our um, uh, policy training. And this continues until we are uh, optimized, converged to uh, uh, optimized rewards. Um, uh, if you are interested in the math of the <clears throat> objective function, here is how it works. So we have a, uh, what we are doing here is for a set of training uh, chips, basically, uh, what we are optimizing the expected reward, um, the, 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 uh, the expected reward for these chips coming up with a policy or training the parameters of the policy uh, modeled uh, parameters shown here by theta. theta. Um, and this is what the uh, reinforcement or the proximal uh, policy optimization ensures that we are doing. Um, the reward function, uh, like I mentioned previously, is a um, weighted average of these three metrics in this case. But as you can see, this is like one advantage of reinforcement learning is that the reward function doesn't have to have any closed form. So if we we could add, if we are interested, we can add a separate timing metric or we can have a separate power optimization metric here and just add it here or uh, add it in other ways that ensures that we are below a certain threshold in any of this. So that gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of what optimizations we can do. Um, in order to be practical and because um, chip net list can be really large, uh, what we did in this work was to take a hybrid approach uh, in which um, we place the nodes of, uh, we place the macro nodes of the netlist with RL, and then we use uh, a force directed method to place the standard cells. Um, and we also cluster the standard cells because standard cells can be, we can have millions of them. So we do a one time clustering, uh, reducing the standard cells um, number to a a um, few thousands, and then we use force-directed method to place those. Um, uh, we actually have a follow-up work in which um, this uh, standard cell placement was replaced by dream place, uh, which is a state-of-the-art academic uh, method for placing standard cells. And um, that work is actually presented in MLCAT uh, this year. So um, once we do that, we can calculate the reward function and then use that feedback to go back and optimize the agent parameters. Um, here uh, we are showing a, an instance of um, a, a real placement on a real TPU v4 block. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, and in this case, the green area shows the standard cells and the white area um, shows the macros. Um, and, and what, what, what you can see here is that the placement that our placer came up with is much more, has a much more uh, organic shape uh, than the very like more uh, or, like uh, regular shape that the human expert placement has. And in this case, back uh, when we ran this method, uh, the time that it took for us to optimize this for this placement was 24 hours versus several weeks for the baseline. Um, and uh, what this basically tells us that, and, and you can see that, that the, the metrics such as wire length are uh, lower is better, but these are basically pretty much similar uh, to each other. So really the advantage that our method here is showing is that we are automating this process. Uh, and not only that, we are doing so much faster than a baseline method that requires this uh, manual uh, iterations. 
Um, now, as part of our uh, uh, optimizations, we were um, and we were very interested in using um, in training the policy in a way that it ger generalizes uh, to new netlist. And what that means is that we we wanted to have to train a policy um, over a uh, uh, over a large set of new netlists. And then that that would that can take a while, but then we want uh, and then we use this netlist on a new uh, we use this policy on a new netlist uh, rather quickly. So uh, doing the optimization for far less, uh, far fewer iterations, and then we use that to optimize uh, the placement quickly. So basically, just like you can think of it when as a learning, uh, like supervised learning model, when we do like image classification, we do like uh, we train a language model. We don't. We can use it quickly, instantly on classifying a new image, right? And in this case, uh, for the policy training, we want to do the same. But um, uh, our intuition, which was through later, came out that we, we still do need some iterations. But uh, it's going to be far few fewer iterations than the original network uh, policy training. So our approach, we we took the uh, kind of a standard approach to first uh, to see what happens if we just take the policy and train it on multiple chips and just test it on a new um, netlist and see if it works. Um, it didn't. Um, another approach that we took was to freeze different layers. This is like a, a common approach in deep learning when you freeze certain layers but allow others um, to kind of train on this new netlist. Um, uh, so you use some of your old data, but you are also you're using uh, tuning on the new chip. Uh, that didn't work either. Um, so what what we end up doing and what worked was to uh, first leverage a supervised learning approach to find the right architecture, and then go about this deep RL policy uh, policy training, uh, which I'm going to describe uh, in the. Uh, uh, next slides. So what we observed was that um, when we are training this policy, um, and for those of you who are familiar with training deep RL uh, policy, uh, we often have a, a value uh, network uh, to reduce the variance of this uh, the training error. Um, the value network, the job of the value network is to kind of give us an estimate of the current value of the uh, the current state of the problem. You can think of it as like if I have a placement right now um, uh, or a partial placement, the value network can tell me how much, how good this partial placement, what is the expected like reward for this partial placement. So what we observed that was that this value network that we were training on a training uh, set of chips uh, we're not really good at generalizing to and accurately predicting uh, the quality of placement uh, that were generated by uh, by the policy on train on um, a, tra train on prior chips. So we had a policy train on prior chips. It was not able to pr predict the value uh, of a partial placement on a new chip. So uh, to improve this problem with the value network not being able to predict the value uh, correctly on a new netlist, what we did was to decompose a problem where we first train models capable of accurately pre predicting um, the reward from off policy data. And here is what it means. Um, so we, um, uh, we took, in this case, I'm showing you five uh, five net, uh, different uh, netlists. Uh, we took five different netlists for five different chips, and then um, we uh, generate placements for, for each of the chips, like uh, in this case, couple thousand placement with various uh, reward trade-offs, and some of them had better violent, some of these placement had better violent and congestion, and some of them had worse. But the goal was that to just generate these placements um, and create these labels, which are the reward functions for this placement. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, these uh, uh, 
10,000 placement total were drawn from a vanilla reinforcement learning policy. So, you know, as you, you're starting training policy in each iteration, you have different placement. Um, uh, and then the placement quality goes from bad to uh, to good in the end when the policy is trained. So we had this various range of uh, trade-offs in the reward functions. Now, our goal uh, was go, go first train a supervised model, uh, see if we can train a supervised model that can predict this reward function on a new netlist. Um, and uh, the way it works is that we had a netlist coming to this uh, supervised model and the output prediction was violent and congestion. So the goal was that can we train this supervised model on a bunch of chips and have very high accuracy when we train this supervised model on a new chip without any further training. And it turns out that we could train such a model. And for doing so, we came up with a new uh, graph neural network um, uh, architecture that could optimize the 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 represent that could well represent the netlist that we had. Uh, here is how this new edge-based graph convolution method uh, works. So at the input um, when we first start uh, create the optimizing this edge-based graph convolution for each node we have a certain information from for example it could be their their previous location, the width and height Basically, we have some information to represent a node, and then we pass them through a fully connected, and this node is as associated uh, with a node of uh, the chip. So we pass that information to a fully connected to get an embedding for that node. Um, once we have that embedding per node, uh, to find the embedding for an edge, we concatenate these node embeddings and also add uh, newer weights, um, concatenate newer weights to this. Uh, edge representation that are really focused on uh, these are trainable weights so we want to see how to represent how to uh, kind of associate certain weights uh, uh, specifically to the edges of these graphs so having this new uh, vector we can um, pass it through a fully connected again that's uh, to get a newer embedding and once we have that embedding we can update uh, node representations with uh, taking the mean of the uh, of the of the edges that we have uh, connected to each node. So basically, we start from some node representation. We updated the edge representation based on that. Now we are going back and updating the nodes based on these edge representations. So we can now iterate and co continue um, this um, a few times. In our case, we did seven times of iterations and. Uh, now, having these representations on edges, we can come up with a graph representation. So basically, we can come up with a new vector uh, by doing a, an operation such as reduce mean on, on the vectors um, representing the edges of this graph. So basically, what we did here was to really like try to capture representations of, of this new netlist. Um, and um, that was basically to to uh, really uh, be able to train a supervised model that can um, optimize rewards such as violent and congestion. So once we had that, uh, then uh, we saw that, okay, the supervised model now can um, have a good accuracy on predicting reward and predicting um, congestion. And now we can use it to continue and um, going back to train a policy that can generalize. Um, I think um, at this point, I can um, switch to Anna. Okay, you just click on, on, on the presenter mode box, and then Anna will take over. Oh. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone. Oh, sorry. Um, so as, as Alia just described, um, we developed this graph, edge-based graph convolutional approach to generate better, more rep more generalizable representations for the components of this netlist that we're trying to place. Um, and here, we wanted to show how this 
this novel edge-based graph convolutional neural net fits into our overall reinforcement learning policy and value networks. So it's basically acting as the encoder to the policy. And it, we use this to generate representations of the edges um, and the macros, uh, which we pass into this fully connected network that is the input to both the policy network and the value network. Um, and it kind of makes sense that this would be helpful for the value net, which is basically predicting how, how the network, how the overall um, RL agent is doing at this task of placement. Uh, and then also passed into this policy network, which is a deconvolutional neural net that generates a probability distribution over all of the um, sort of grid cells that we might place the current node onto. Um, and as you can see, we also make use of a mask. So um, this is one way that we can enforce certain hard constraints, like macros cannot overlap um, on the canvas. It also helps us to effectively reduce the search space. Um, so here, um, we're showing a placement of an Arian risk five CPU core. And so the, each of these squares is a macro that we're placing. And as you can see on the right, if we take a policy that's already been pre-trained on a bunch of blocks, and then we show it a previously unseen chip to place, um, it already starts off with this kind of shape with this, um, the macros are surrounding this convex hole in the center where the standard cells can be placed. Um, whereas the policy that's trained from scratch on the left, it starts out basically random and it eventually converges to something that looks very similar to this um, pre-trained policy, um, but it takes much longer. And in this case, actually the quality is not quite as good. Um, and so here's, here's a plot of the, of the training curve in this case. So the blue line is the policy that's trained from scratch and the green line is a, this um, pre-trained policy being fine-tuned. So it takes um, over 40 hours for this policy trained from scratch to you know, reach a similar level of quality. Um, so here we're showing some results on four different TPU blocks and then that Ariane risk 5 CPU core that we just showed. Um, so what's interesting here is that uh, if you, so the, the pale blue line, the palest blue line is zero shot. This is just taking our pre-trained policy and just inferring with it for a new previously unseen chip. So generating a placement in less than a second. Uh, and then as the, the blue becomes darker, this is more, more hours that we spent fine tuning on this particular chip. Um, and the interesting thing is that we can generate higher quality results um, in less time by fine tuning than training from scratch for over 24 hours until convergence. Um, so here, uh, as we're showing the effect of training set size on convergence property. So um, the green bars represent um, a policy that's pre-trained on that small data set, meaning two blocks. Um, the blue line is pre-trained on five blocks and the large on, on 20 blocks. Um, and the x-axis is showing the effect of how much time we spend fine-tuning. And he here you can see that um, increasing the size of the pre-training data sets um, is just has a massive impact on the performance, especially at zero shot. And we find this very encouraging because we feel that if we could get access to more uh, chip blocks or more um, designs, um, we could potentially greatly reduce or um, greatly improve the quality of the zero shot placement or the, the fine tuned placement after a small number of hours. Um, and this can potentially have implications for, you know, co-optimizing with earlier stages of the chip design process. If we can generate like in a zero, uh, zero shot, high quality zero shot placement, um, you know, that can be the inner loop for some kind of optimization of earlier stages. Um, and here on the right, we're showing um, the convergence properties for, for the different uh, data set sizes. So you can see that the smaller the data set, the more uh, quickly we start overfitting to that data set. Um, so here are some comparisons uh, with uh, previous state-of-the-art baselines, um, including uh, Replace, which is uh, the prior academic state-of-the-art, and Manual, which was in some sense the real state-of-the-art, which is human experts spending weeks or months placing uh, the components themselves. 
um, often with the assistance of commercial EDA tools. Um, and so the metrics here were timing, so worth uh, W and S, T and S, uh, area, power, wiring length, and congestion. And these are the metrics, and these were uh, generated, these metrics, with a commercial EDA tool, which is kind of the gold standard in terms of simulating or the what would the quality of this given placement be. And this is what uh, physical designers use, when, at least at Google, when they're trying to decide which placement they want to send for fabrication. Um, as you can see, our method compares quite favorably uh, to these prior approaches. Um, and here I just wanted to share some of um, the compute resources that we use uh, to achieve these experimental results. So for pre-training, we use the same number of workers as we had blocks in the training data sets, um, so 2, 5, and 20. Um, and uh, we, so for example, for the largest training set with 20 blocks, we pre-train on 20 GPU workers. The pre-training runtime was 20, 48 hours. Uh, and for fine-tuning results, we run on 16 GPUs for up to six hours. But because we employ an off early stopping uh, criteria, we often use uh, significantly less than six hours on the fine-tuning step. And for um, both pre-training and fine-tuning, a worker consists of an NVIDIA Volta GPU and 10 CPUs, each with two gigabytes of RAM. And for zero-shot mode, so that means applying a pre-trained policy that's uh, with no fine-tuning, uh, we can generate a placement in less than a second on a single GPU. And so just a quick update on this uh, project, we were used in production on the latest generation of TPU. Um, the inference chip has been taped out um, and a number of our blocks are being, our placements are being used on the inference version of the latest TPU. And we are also getting adoption in uh, pixel blocks. And uh, we were recently published in Nature and we've um, gotten some interest. Uh, and um, now I'm going to talk about the other project that Azalia had alluded to, which is um, FAST, a full stack accelerator search technique uh, for vision applications. Um, and the goal that we had when we started this project is that we wanted to be able to automatically design new machine learning accelerators for target uh, workloads by co-optimizing hardware and the software. And we also wanted to create a new simulator platform that would be capable of modeling generic machine learning accelerators across different product families, uh, and therefore be able to generate insights into uh, through full stack analysis uh, with the goal of targeting like a multiplier speed up. So this work that we previously discussed on physical design or placement optimization, it's very um, important from a basically reducing the latency of the chip design cycle perspective, since humans were spending months placing macros, but there was a limit on the performance improvements that we could hope to achieve. Um, we don't know exactly where the ceiling is, but there's, it's not possible to achieve a multiplier um, improvement in the performance of the chip solely through um, placement optimization or macro placement. So in some ways, we, we, so we felt that targeting this earlier stage um, could potentially be more impactful um, in the long term. So here we present a case study um, on efficient net, which is a family of uh, convolutional neural nets that achieve state-of-the-art image net top one accuracy. So you can see in this plot on the, on the bottom right um, that this sort of efficient net family of B0 for B7 is kind of on this pre-optimal curve outperforming these um, prior like evolutionary approaches or like human generated neural architectures for this uh, image net top one accuracy. And the main building block for this uh, architecture is an MVCOM, which is based on depth-wise separable convolution. And this uh, network, this architecture is known to run inefficiently on both TPUs and GPUs. And we're going to focus on this efficient net family as a case study for uh, this FAST framework. And here on the left, you can see the sort of architecture for this efficient at B0 baseline network. And um, part of what we observe is that uh, this depth-wise uh, that this model is achieving poor operational intensity with traditional fusion techniques. 
So operational intensity is a measure of a workload's compute to bandwidth ratio. Um, and here we're comparing different fusion techniques um, to an ideal fusion um, of this network. So one of the baselines is, what if we only fuse the convolution and the ReLU? Um, another baseline is, let's fuse um, the depth-wise separable comp and the MV comp. And another would be, we pin all of the weights. So we take, all, we keep all the weights in SRAM. And then we compare that to the ideal scenario, which is, what if we fuse every single operation in this model and we pin all of the weights and keep them, keep them in SRAM? So that, that's that uh, pale blue line on the, on the right. Um, and here, you, the, the, the fact that there's such a large gap here suggests that there's an opportunity, there's um, headroom um, by just improving the fusion um, uh, for this network. And so here we're profiling efficient at V7 um, as a function of the layer number. And the, there's very poor uh, overall utilization, just 14.8% as a fraction of the TPUV3 peak flops. And the depth wise convolution, the depth 2D, COM 2D is a key challenge here as you can see on the, the bottom left. Uh, as a percentage of flops, it's 5%, but it takes up 65% of the runtime. So to address this, uh, we need to um, fix the following bottlenecks. So this, the scheduling, which is how we map key operations onto the data path. We need to also change the data path, change the microarchitectural micro parameters, including the dimensions of the systolic array. And we also need to do a better job of uh, choosing which ops to fuse in order to improve the operational intensity. And so here uh, we're showing an overview of our FAST framework. And this is an automated search technique um, to explore both um, compute and memory bottlenecks through um, updates to data path mapping and fusion. And you know, just to give an idea of the size or the scale of the problem, the search space just for the processing element data paths is 10 to the 11th um, for the per op scheduling. So the decision about um, how to schedule each of the ops, it's 10 to the 2000. And um, in terms of op fusion, like deciding which ops to fuse, the search spaces are on the order of 10 to the 300. Um, and here, this is just a showing an overview of, of how this um, fast framework is laid out. So basically it takes as input this neural network model. Um, it makes use of this TPU sim that I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, which um, outputs an end-to-end, -end, an estimate of the end-to-end -end performance and power estimates um, for both um, the neural net and the uh, hardware that um, is being um, explored. So here is, um, a description of the search space that we're using for FAST. And our goal here is to create an approximate superset. So we would like to be able to model um, accelerators that exist today, like TPU, um, but also accelerators don't, that don't yet exist, but which might be more effective for uh, running work, uh, machine learning workloads that are prevalent. Um, and so here, like on the right, you can see different um, dimensions that we can vary, like um, the dimensions of the systolic array, various properties of the memory hierarchy. So memory levels are optional and they can be private or shared. And if you wanted to model a scalar or vector uh, processing element, you can just set the systolic array dimensions to one. Um, and so here we can compare um, performance versus like a, a TPUV3 baseline uh, targeting single and multiple workloads. And so it's here, this is basically, we want to be able to see what performance gains can we achieve if we were to heavily customize the hardware? What if we optimize for one particular model or one set of models? Um, and what we found was that there's a potential for approximately 2x speed up on existing TPUV3 uh, just through software updates, so more efficient MXU mappings and, and more, more better off fusion. Um, and we can achieve up to an 8.5x 8, uh, 8 speed up 
um, by also doing data path uh, and software co-optimization. Um, so here, the, the blue line is a TPV3 baseline. The red line is this software only updates. Um, where, so there, there's definitely an improvement. And then the green line is just, you know, if we were to focus on a single workload and, you know, vary all of the data path off fusion and schedule. And um, here we show an ablation study to try to understand like how are these um, imp performance improvements achieved or unlocked. And um, so the blue component would be just a, the TPU uh, V3 baseline. If we add this scheduling, improved scheduling or mapping um, the ops onto the data path, um, you know, that we get significant gains. And if you add updates to this data path, we get somewhat some some further gains, but a little quite modest. In order to unlock these gains, um, we need to add this operation fusion. Then we see the promise of this, you know, fast framework or this co-optimization with the hard hardware and the model. So uh, here's a efficient uh, V7 per layer efficiency. So we're um, plotting uh, peak flops or percentage of peak flops. Um, and we found that the discovered, one of the discovered architectures, fast, large, um, significantly improves overall efficiency. Um, but the early layer efficiency is still low. Um, and as you go from 128 by 128 to a 32 by 32 MXUs, you improve, you can improve the utilization, but you become bandwidth bound. Um, but once we enable fast fusion uh, technique, we can remove this uh, bandwidth bottleneck. Um, and this, this, this plot kind of shows the potential application level impact for fast. Um, so we can enable uh, improved ML uh, inference performance through fast, either by reducing the inference latency on average by about 5x for the same accuracy, or if we you know, have a fixed latency budget, we can achieve higher accuracy. Um, and the, the techniques in this presentation don't require any changes to the model. So you, know, you can get even further gains by performing um, these kind of orthogonal techniques like quantization, pruning, or um, updates to the architecture of the neural network itself. Um, and we think that's like a promising uh, direction. Uh, so key takeaways, uh, we developed FAST, which is a full stack accelerator search technique for vision and NLP applications. We can achieve about a 2x improvement on uh, queries per second using only software cha changes, or uh, we can achieve uh, up to 8.5x improvement in QPS um, if we also update the data path and schedule uh, along with um, op fusion. And um, these improvements are we've observed on both vision models and some NLP models. And um, we also developed a simulator that's capable of modeling a comprehensive set of uh, state-of-the-art vision and NLP benchmarks. It in, and it includes a scheduler and cost model for sub 10 nanometers. And this uh, simulator is based on extensions of both Google's TFSIM and NVIDIA's time loop. Um, if you're interested to learn more about this work or other work by our uh, machine learning for systems and chip design team, um, please check out our papers. And I want to thank all of our co-authors um, for uh, working with us on this and you, you all for your attention today. So thanks, Anna and Azalia. Uh, it was very, very interesting and inspiring. So if you uh, stop sharing and then we'll move to Q&A mode. So I open, I open the Q&A mode. Azalia, you are welcome to click yourself here and then we'll be in, in the banner so, so you both can answer. And I encourage uh, people at the audience to, to click themselves and ask questions. I can see two questions from Leon and from uh, Chitwuba uh, at the chat. If you want to click yourself and ask uh, 
You're welcome. Otherwise, I will just read the questions and let you answer. So Leon asked, what, what is the area metric? Uh, it was um, in one of the slides. And any explanation why it varies uh, so widely on block two? Okay, um, so so the area, so the way we, we were showing that, uh, uh, like basically EDA tool output is that we fix the macro placement, we run it by the EDA tool, and we get the metrics in area, um, timing, violent, and uh, such, right? This is, uh, and the area for that block too, basically it's like at the end when everything is uh, passed through the place up stage, how much area this block uh, like roughly uses um, and in that block block two if you uh, look into the data the violent there's a uh, there's a difference between violent of different methods so if the violent is higher that the, in order to like uh, basically do all the routing using those wires uh, it uses more real estate so the violent can be higher uh, area could be related to timing as well, um, different ways of adding flops to, to meet the timing criteria or optimize for that can um, affect the area. The more flops you add, the higher area you have. So that those variations are coming from the EDA tool. Thanks, I see Mark, you're, you're in, in the questioning bars. Uh, you're muted and without camera. So you're welcome to ask a question. Thanks. Um, uh, but actually, I think uh, uh, someone else asked a question before me. Do you want to go through the uh, Ramesh oh. first? Oh. OK, no problem. So given the number of uh, uh, varieties uh, of netlist there can be generalizing uh, or transferring learning uh, to a new netlist is impressive. We struggle uh, with this problem ourselves. Did you restrict yourself to some sort of sub, uh, subset of netlist? in the training and validation data sets? Uh, is this related uh, to training set blocks? Um, so I guess I'm not sure I complete, completely understand. So is it that like we try to make sure that this, the blocks don't vary too much from each other? Or is it like, we, oh. we agree that generalization is very challenging. A lot of our, our development effort was focused on Right, yeah, sorry. Um, I guess you can hear me. Can you? Yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Um, thank you for your answer. But um, I was wondering if you restricted yourself to certain kinds of netlists that maybe the domain knowledge can be characterized as a certain kind of, um, you know, um, a certain kind of uh, silicon coping device thing. I think the opposite in the sense that we wanted as wide a variety of, of chip blocks as possible in our, our training data set and ideally to be represented in our uh, like dev or validation training uh, data sets. Okay. okay. Um, so, so the blocks that you mentioned in your training data set have nothing to do with um, what are those blocks? have nothing to do with. Oh, I wasn't sure what to say. Um, well, so are, are they, so do you mean to say that you have different types of netlists and then a block corresponds to a type of netlist perhaps? Is that how I should interpret yeah. it? So in our case, we were looking at TPU netlists and the RE on RISC-V core. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've gotten some good results on some pixel blocks. So that's for us uh, validation, but our goal was to have as varied a set of blocks as possible. Thanks. Okay, is that my turn? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks, uh, uh, Azaria, and uh, uh, thanks for uh, giving a great talk uh, at Malcad uh, again. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, I do have uh, like a couple of uh, uh, detailed questions, and uh, hopefully, you can get some insight from you guys. Um, so, like for example, the first one uh, you mentioned uh, uh, using the supervised training at the beginning to uh, tune the model architecture. Uh, I wonder if that's uh, the weights that's been trained with that supervised uh, learning 
uh, getting transferred to the reinforcement learning now? We actually don't. We throw away those weights. We use just the architecture, but it, it is a bit silly. Like we, we were getting good results, so we we didn't use those weights. But maybe we can try that because why shouldn't it help? Yeah, or like some sort of a pre-training weights, like you can train stuff yeah. on that, right? So, oh, oh, I see, I see. So, so it's not been tried. Okay. Um, second is uh, I I noticed the paper, right? Uh, you haven't mentioned that here, but the, in the in your nature paper, uh, you actually have uh, you say the graph that you guys are building uh, is sort of based on some sort of timing, like timing distance, like register timing distance, right? Mm -hmm. It's not actually using uh, cluster weights, right? So, you know, like if when you cluster designs into like cell clusters, you know, all the, the weights between the clusters are actually higher, right? Like, you know, not just one net and multiple nets, right? I, I guess, but in the graph you actually generating, uh, using for this RL work, it's not the, the, the wireless uh, based, uh, connectivity based graph, it's more like a, a, a timing distance based graph. I, I wonder if, if that's the reason that the timing actually gets better since you don't have the timing rewards in, you know, in the rewards. Yeah, I think that's actually possible that that decision subtly helps with uh, timing optimization. I think- Yeah, we, and we have our input is a synthesized netlist. So, so the synthesis alone, like the way these ascender cells are created is after some synthesis, right? The, uh, right. Uh, there is some, um, the tool that synthesizer does try to optimize timing, even though the placements are not very good, but the tool is trying to optimize uh, timing just to synthesize things. Um, and then once we have that synthesized netlist, uh, the, the, we already are in. Uh, there, the, there is some of it, some sort of optimization done, and we, when we do the clustering of them, uh, we try to kind of localize. Um, the nodes that are, um, so the, the nodes in a way that we don't put the two clusters too far away from each other and the violent is really helping us again with timing afterwards. So we have like two, two kind of properties that are helping us with timing. I think the other thing that we had theorized was that the graph neural net places nodes that are in the same like path close to each other because they have that, like that we do have the names of the ops in some case, so maybe it can figure out this hierarchy. Yeah, so the memory nodes in the same hierarchy gets are closer to each other, which is interesting. Like we didn't force them to, to do so, but it kind of was a learned property. So yeah. So, so yeah, that, because you have that edge, right? You have the uh, you know in a graph, you have that edge between uh, macros that we see in certain timing bound, right? Like you know, if it's we've seen like one register distance, I think that that's the what's in the paper you're saying, you know, if it's one, one register distance, you have like half weights, otherwise exactly. two so registers like quarter yeah. weights. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so okay. that, that's a rough estimate, but I think the other point we were saying that mac memory macros in the same memory hierarchy are kind of placed close to each other. So if we like do a coloring scheme to see like how different memory like hierarchies like are placed to each other. We see that the same uh, hierarchy, the same colors are kind of grouped to each other, which was like a byproduct of the way we do the embedding. We didn't force them, but that's something that physical designers care about, like sort of other than these metrics, they want to see um, right. certain micros close to each other. Okay, okay. Next. we have another. We have another question from Sne. Does the noise not good optimization of ETA tools impact results? Um, yeah, we don't have the EDA tool in the loop of our optimization. So our the, the way the EDA tool results come in is the correlation with our proxy costs because we do optimization only on the proxy costs. So yes, if they're noisy, uh, it makes it harder to make the proxy cost. But in the end, all we care about is the correlation rather than the exact prediction of of the performance. And because of that, we have more room to be um, error tolerant. Thanks. And, and last question for me. At the beginning, 
uh, of the talk, you, you, you stated a very ambitious uh, uh, goal of uh, reducing the time uh, for uh, designing a new chip from a year and a half, two years to a couple of weeks. Now, I guess placement uh, is, even if we reduce placement to, to no time, uh, it cannot be the, the entire solution. So can you say something about the other aspects of chip design that you are focusing on? Um, yeah, I think, so our long-term vision would be to do like end-to-end -end automated and optimized um, chip design. Obviously we're not there yet, um, and, but we're actively working on that. So this chip floor planning work is one piece of this overall puzzle. This work that we presented in the second half of the talk, doing basically architectural exploration is another piece. But there are many steps in the middle. Maybe Azalea, you can comment more. Yeah, so, so here in this uh, talk, we talked about hardware software co-design, and then we talked about placement. Uh, there are some stages that come in between, right? Creating the RTL. Um, for example, and passing the RTL to the placement route, uh, there is also um, uh, verification, uh, which is another key step in all of the design. So we, we are working on uh, on all of these areas right now. Uh, of course, we have we don't have uh, we haven't made it two weeks yet, but uh, but this is our plan because we think that just on the hardware software co design. Um, there is a lot of like opportunity for getting a lot of performance improvement from the chip um, that uh, showing that performance improvement, I think we our, 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 we want to motivate that maybe it does make sense to make like more custom chips, more iterations of chip design faster if we can really get this much performance by doing the customization. So it's like further reiterates why we need to make chips faster, cheaper, more automated, because then we can iterate more and do more customization. Um, but uh, that's one. And the second part is a lot of different stages. The names are different and a lot of uh, <laughs> the core problems uh, are different, but from a mathematical or optimization perspective, a lot of them are similar. Like if we, we are thinking about them from a learning approach. So that's why we are hopeful that we can make uh, major advances to our, towards that uh, goal. So, so thank you. And uh, we will be definitely looking forward to, 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 to more results. By the way, the keynotes tomorrow uh, also, uh, we represent some works from, from Google on, on verification. So uh, stay tuned. And I want to thank, again, thank you again, uh, Anna and Azalia, for a great talk. And uh, with this, uh, I will hand over uh, for you, Mark, for the uh, paper session today. So, so thanks again. And Anna, you, you should just unclick yourself from, from the speaker, and I will unclick myself from the moderator, and Mark, all yours. <laughs>